Hello and welcome. This is Worlds for Create a Learning Site, the place to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. In the previous issue of Create a Learning Site, in the letter edition, uh, I mentioned that I would really like to get a, a better microphone to improve the quality of the sound of these recordings. And so um, here it is. Uh, it's called a Yeti microphone. Thanks, by the way, if you help make this possible. And um, well, uh, if you were thinking that in this digital age devices are getting smaller and smaller, you were thinking the same thing that I was thinking, but uh, I guess not. But here's to better quality sound uh, in the future. For this month's issue, well, I often get asked what my favorite book of the Bible is. And my standard answer is, it's not the one people like to hear. I don't know. Uh, there's a number of books that come to mind, but when, which one of these would be my favorite is hard to tell. Now, here's what I do know. Deuteronomy isn't one of them. It never makes it to this list. And yet, it is a book that is truly foundational for the rest of the Old Testament. So maybe I need to rethink this. After all, Deuteronomy can be thought of as the capstone of the Torah, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books in our Bible. It's the measuring stick used by the prophets when they condemn Israel's faithlessness. And it's also um, the foundation for the historical books, Joshua through Kings, uh, the standard used in these books um, to judge the kings of Israel and Israel itself. Uh, it's for this reason that these books are sometimes referred to as Deuteronomistic history, because they lean so much on the book of Deuteronomy. Daniel Bock, whose commentary on Deuteronomy I recently read, has this to say about its theological importance. Quote, Inasmuch as this book offers the most systematic presentation of theological truth in the entire Old Testament, we may compare its place to that of Romans in the New Testament. Now, the general editor of this commentary series has obviously misread this. In his preface, he states, At one point, he, that is uh, Daniel Bock, claims it is the most systematic presentation of theological truth in the entire Bible, rivaled perhaps only by Paul's Romans. Now, wait a moment. Probably not even Romans can keep up with Deuteronomy? That's not quite what Bock claimed. His statement in the first quote is more realistic than this. Even so, I don't think I quite agree. Genesis, and especially Isaiah, come to mind as theological statements in the Old Testament, matching or perhaps surpassing Deuteronomy. Okay, Isaiah may not be very systematic, but it certainly contains an enormous amount of theological truth. Still, Box claim did give me reason to consider Deuteronomy and spend some time with this book, give it a second chance. There's a, another reason why I decided to spend some time studying Deuteronomy recently. In the past, I have occasionally been asked to teach this book. I've always declined because I would need time to prepare. Uh, I haven't taught the book for a very long time and I haven't taught it often, so I would need some serious time to prepare. By the time an invitation comes, it's already too late to make that time available. So I decided to be proactive and give myself a head start, just in case I get asked again. There's one thing that has always fascinated me about uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, I first learned of this some years even before I did the School of Biblical Studies, uh, <clears throat> when I uh, picked up a book at the local flea market. Uh, this is the book. Uh, it was first published in 1965. Uh, you can perhaps see that it's uh, a bit older. Uh, and it turned out to be one of my first discoveries uh, in biblical studies. Uh, we're talking early 1980s here. Uh, it, it, it was a book 
uh, that helped me to see a, a whole book of the Bible uh, in an entirely new light. It suddenly made so much more sense. The thing is this, uh, Deuteronomy clearly copies the form of a formal treaty in use at the time, that of a covenant between a king and his vessel, usually a conquered nation or its ruler. A number of such treaty texts have been found, dating roughly uh, to the second millennium BC, so between 2000 and 1000 uh, before Christ, uh, and they show remarkable similarity to the book of Deuteronomy, in structure especially. Now, uh, if you've attended an SBS, this may well sound familiar to, to you, but uh, maybe it's good to have a refresher anyway. So, um, the treaty form is often called a suzerainty covenant. It's a bit of a strange word, suzerainty and suzerain. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of a counterpart to the words sovereignty and sovereign. Uh, sovereignty uh, means that a nation has power over itself. Suzerainty uh, means um, <clears throat> that another nation uh, is in power uh, uh, over uh, a nation. Uh, a, a suzerain is an overlord. Uh, he lords it over another lord or king. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this uh, kind of a, a structure uh, developed in the area of international politics. Uh, the, the way to build an empire was to go out and conquer nations, subdue them, make them your vessel. Uh, and uh, there was a downside to this. Uh, it led to a perennial cycle of such nations trying to break out of the special relationship, uh, and then they would have to be subdued. Uh, and then they would rebel again, and so forth. The suzerainty covenant was uh, developed as uh, a way to order the relationship between nations in a more peaceful way. It offered an alternative to brute force. And, and as such, it represented a step forward in international politics and diplomacy. The rough outline of such a covenant document would look like this. First, there's the preamble, a uh, sort of introduction to the text, which often mentions the mediator. Then follows the historical prologue. This is a section that recalls all the good things that the king has done for his new vessel. For Israel, in the book of Deuteronomy, this includes the exodus from Egypt, God's provision in the desert, and the initial victories over the kings east of the Jordan, Sion of Heshbon and Og of Bashan. It coincides with the first speech of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. The third section, Stipulations, details the obligations of both parties in the covenant relationship. And in the case of Deuteronomy, this begins with a general section, with a call for commitment to the covenant, that's chapter 5 through 11 followed by specific regulations in chapter 12 through 26. So this is by far the longest uh, part of the book. All of this uh, is part of the second speech by Moses, which actually runs a little further uh, down to Deuteronomy 29 verse 1. Sanctions in the form of curses and blessings these are the consequences of faithfulness or unfaithfulness to the covenant. This part corresponds to chapter 27 through 29 in Deuteronomy and therefore is still part of the second speech. Then follow arrangements for the continuity, uh, the continuation of the a covenant relationship. Witnesses, uh, this would normally include in the depositing of a copy of the could treaty be text in, in the sanctuary the of the vessel the nation, relationship was and reached. the public reading so of the treaty text these and text would be intervals. the guards of uh, the king in Deuteronomy, uh, this is set at for obvious reasons. Years. This does not work where the covenant is between God and Israel, and therefore in this case we read about other witnesses. Heaven and earth, the book of the law, 
and even the prophetic song in chapter 32 that's uh, specifically referred to as a witness as well. Beyond this there are several more sections in the book of Deuteronomy. First there's the third speech of Moses. Uh, it takes the form of um, a ceremony in which the covenant, uh, the treaty, is renewed uh, and therefore uh, it's still directly related to the treaty uh, and it actually includes several of the elements listed above. And the book finishes with Moses speaking a prophetic blessing over the tribes of Israel uh, and with a report of his death. Uh, now these sections do not have a counterpart in the standard outline of a suzerainty covenant. I think it's fascinating that God would take this existing human format to formalize his special relationship with the people of Israel. He speaks a language they would have understood. One of the new insights I gained through giving Deuteronomy a second chance uh, also relates to its structure. Uh, Deuteronomy can be understood as an exposition of the Ten Commandments uh, in their order. In other words, its structure follows these ten words as they're actually called in the text itself. They are stated in Deuteronomy chapter 5 at the beginning of the second speech and their exposition begins in chapter 6. Now, exposition is probably too strong a word. It's perhaps more like a loose arrangement of thematically related commandments in each of these ten sections. Now I'm going to follow Walter Kaiser who takes the opening statement, I am the Lord your God, as the first of the ten words and combines what are often considered two commandments into one. Uh, thou, shalt have, thou shalt have no other gods and no graven images. Uh, I'm not quite sure if that's really the way we should take it, but that's his structure and I'm going to follow it. It looks like this. One, he is the Lord your God. It's a call to fear, love, serve and obey God. In one word, this is all about commitment, love him in return. The section could also be understood as a general introduction or as an exposition of the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We could restate it as a positive. Make him your God and love him only, which you do by keeping his commandments. Two, no other gods and no graven image. Now, this section of the book imposes one place as the only place of worship and this functions as an antidote to idolatry with its multiple other gods, its graven images and its many places of worship. Three, taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, since this chapter deals with unclean animals and with the tithe, the link to the third commandment is not very clear. Perhaps we ought to think of a positive counterpart to the prohibition, sanctify his name, uh, which then would include the tithe and abstaining from unclean animals. That's the way of sanctifying, of honoring the Lord's name. Four, keeping the Sabbath. Here the thematic link is pretty clear. Uh, this is mostly about the Sabbath year and the three main festivals. In other words, it's about sacred time. Five, honoring father and mother. Perhaps not all the material fits easily here, but it seems that the subject is enlarged to cover leadership in other areas, as well as justice and honoring of leadership. Uh, for instance, when it's about bringing a blemished sacrifice, which is not exactly a way to honor God. Six, murder. Now here the thematic link is strong and the discussion of blood guilt and witnesses does indeed serve as an exposition of the commandment. The war laws in chapter 20 fit in as well, even though they're a bit more loosely related. Seven, adultery. Now, not all the material in this section fits, but there is a focus on marriage and sexual issues. Eight, stealing. Now, it seems the organizing principle in this section is property issues. Nine, false testimony. 
Or even more than in section three with the third commandment, the thematic link here is not very clear. Some of this material more readily fits the previous one, property issues. Walter Kaiser calls this section just dealings, which is very general. 10. Coveting. Now, Walter Kaiser calls this section honesty and duty, which is rather broad, and indeed the thematic links are quite loose here. So it's not a perfect principle of organization, but there is at least a tendency in Deuteronomy to follow the Ten Commandments and arrange the material according to this framework. Here are a few more things I picked up from giving Deuteronomy a second chance. First, uh, it is in this book that we get to know Moses as pastor. He's not laying down the law, but is pleading with the people to live according to this covenantal agreement, and it's for their own good. Moses, still the shepherd he became in the land of Midian, pours out his pastoral heart for his flock. Now, what do pastors do? Pastors preach sermons, among other things. They expound and explain and exhort and challenge and encourage. And this is exactly what Deuteronomy does and what the book is. It is a sermon preached by Moses, his last one. In it, he explains the law and this makes it an expository sermon. As the text tells us at the beginning, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law. Now, three, you've probably heard it before, but it's worth repeating. When it comes to the Hebrew word Torah, law is a bit of a poor translation, even though it's often translated this way, even in the New Testament. Uh, but instruction or teaching would often be better. Let's face it, roughly a third of the Torah, of the law, consists of stories, and therefore does not fit the category of law at all. Even the book of Deuteronomy does not present itself to us as a legal text or a collection of commandments. It is first and foremost a sermon. Uh, on top of this, the sermon is embedded in historical narrative. Uh, in other words, uh, we don't have the script of what Moses preached. Uh, we are told the story of Moses preaching the sermon. Strictly speaking then, like Genesis and much of Exodus, Deuteronomy is also historical narrative. The name Deuteronomy that we use for this book literally means second law. Now, that too is a poor choice. First, as is now clear, it's not really a law book. And then second, it's not it's not like it's something new or different that can therefore be considered a second law or a second Torah. It's an explanation of the first and only Torah. Now, fourth, if Deuteronomy conveys one thing besides love for God and commitment to God, I think it would be justice. It imparts a passion for what must be one of God's own central values. As the text puts it, justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So Deuteronomy is not an exhaustive or complete overview of everything that is right or wrong. Such an overview is not and cannot be the same. Rather, it seeks to convey a hard attitude toward God and toward humans in order to build a society that is thoroughly shaped by this value. Justice, only justice. Now, that alone makes this a book worth studying. Thank you.